chapter 33. And it, uh, it was Moses saying to the Lord, Now therefore I pray you, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your, your way that I may know you, that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, the Lord said to him, my presence shall be with you and I will give you rest. So that even in the old covenant, no, God was full of grace. And when Moses asked, he gave him um, rest and he said that his presence was always with him. So I think the Lord's just wanted to reiterate that he wants us to enjoy his rest. And then there's another scripture in um, Hebrews that I've been reading recently. Hebrews chapter 4. Um, there remains therefore a rest for God's people. And it's talking about the rest in the finished work of the cross because thankfully Jesus has done all that we need and he wants us to enjoy that rest that he has achieved for us and all the benefits of that. Therefore remains there for a rest to the people of God for he that enters into his rest also has ceased from his own works. We can all try and uh, do our own works as God did from his. Let us therefore labor so that the only work that he wants us to do now is laboring to enter into his rest. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into the rest, lest any man shall fall after the same example of unbelief. And then it goes on to say, and I think the way that we find out this rest and about the finished work of the cross is obviously you no know, reading God's word, meeting together, etc. Um, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrows and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of God's heart. And so really just to encourage you, you know, to enjoy God's rest because uh, you know, that's what he purchased for us you know, through his own, own blood. And uh, we've got Peter speaking tonight, which is a very close friend of myself and Tom, and thankfully we've been able to introduce him to people at Victory Church, and people have embraced him as a wonderful friend of theirs and Victory Church. And here we are in August, not even the end of August, and I think it would be fair to say that that prophecy was absolutely spot on. Whether it be in Uganda, in Africa, in Libya, in Saudi Arabia, Iran, further afield in Malaysia, we see Christians being turfed out their houses, their children being sold into slavery, the women being raped and murdered, and the men being shot. My question to you is, what are we as church going to do about it? Are we simply going to accept what's going on? Are we going to make a difference? I want to show you that it was God's plan. It was God's plan for 2014 that the church would rise up, that the church would become brighter and stronger as the world becomes darker and darker. I've divided tonight's... um, preach into five sections, and they're all with P. It starts with provision. What I want to do is lay a foundation of what Jesus has already done to make sure we really understand that we have everything we need to lead a powerful, a powerful lifestyle. There's power and there's purpose. God didn't save us just to, so we could go to heaven. If so, surely what he would have done was simply the minute we gave our lives to Jesus, he would have zipped us off to heaven. No. He left us here because of a job to do. And then we look at prospering. Even though what's going on, just to remind you that only yesterday there was a report in the Times 
which said that Europe is about to go into what they call a, a triple dip recession. What a lovely word. So, look, someone like me, I thought it sounds like an ice cream, triple dip. But in fact, no, it's a lot worse than that. What they're saying is that Europe is about to fall down once again. But I'm going to show you that God's given us protection and whatever we come against, whatever it might feel becoming, God will see us through. So there's provision, power, purpose to prosper with protection. Hallelujah. We'll start by looking at Romans 8. As I said before, what's very important is to understand that it's not about us. It's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about, even about Victory Church. It's about Jesus and what Jesus has already done for us. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Let's make one thing very clear. In these days, the enemy will do whatever he can to try and convince you that you cannot do it. You're either too old or you're too young. Or do you remember what you did yesterday? Do you remember what you said to so-and-so? I remember, he'll remind you of what you thought. But the truth is there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Because why? Because you're walking according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. Can someone shout hallelujah? For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. Don't we see nowadays the world just living for themselves? It's all about me, the rhythm factor. What's in it for me? But we, church, come with a different spirit. We come with a different spirit. We say, Jesus first. Because we, we understand what Jesus did for us. We understand the love, the love that Jesus has for us. The sacrifice he went through on the cross that we might have eternal life. It's about right thinking, church. Because if we've got right thinking, we'll have right believing. If we've got right believing, then we can do all things through Christ. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be kindly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. More than ever, church, nowadays, we need life. Life in the church and peace. So that whatever goes on around us, we don't have to worry. So we read about the problems in the newspapers with a bank crisis and the co-op bank or whoever it is losing fortunes and the problems in, in, abroad in America, in Europe. No, we have peace. Why? Because our mindset is not set on earthly things. It's set on spiritual things. News for you, heaven is not bankrupt. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. There's a town out here, Grimsby, which is going to hell because they just think about themselves. They think about the flesh. Just what can Saturday nights or Sunday nights, I was, I was watching a program earlier, I was absolutely amazed how Lincoln has gone downhill, excuse the expression, in the last five years. The Saturday nights, it's just mayhem. We're talking about Lincoln. Probably Grimsby's the same, I don't know. But here's the good news. Verse 9. But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Hallelujah! If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Hallelujah! The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and living in each and every one of us. Church, that's great news for today. That's great news for today. You're not under grace. Sorry, you're not under the law. You're under grace. Grace. Ah, oh, unmerited favor. 
unmerited power to do what God calls us to do. But church, I've seen so many churches, I'm not talking about here, but I've been in so many churches where they still preach the law, where they still preach about doing stuff. And we've got to make one thing clear. I know as far as this church is concerned, it's not preached. But let's make one thing very clear. It's not about works. It's not about what you do. It's about Jesus and what he did for each and every one of us. What's so important is just to grasp the fact that Jesus died on the cross. He suffered for each and every one of us. He died so that we might have eternal life, but he died as well that we might have life to the full here on earth. This earth is very quickly going downhill. And these people like us, the light on the hill, to stand up and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will not be swayed by fear. We will not be swayed by what we read in the, mirror, in the, in the newspapers, on the media. We will not be swayed by what we hear. But we will do what God calls us to do. We'll do what God calls us to do because we know how much Jesus loves us. When you have a true revelation of how much Jesus really loves you, you just want to do everything for him. When you have a true revelation of the love of Jesus, nothing is too much trouble. When you have a true revelation of how much Jesus loves you, you don't have fear. Perfect love casts out fear. It doesn't matter what's happening around you. It doesn't matter what's probably happening to your next door neighbours or whatever. Or what, even what the enemy tries to put upon you. There is no fear because you know that Jesus loves you. You have a true understanding of that love that Jesus has for you. I am sure that I'm not the only one that's found 2014 quite an interesting year. And I use the word interesting in the sense that more than once, I'm sure, we've had situations and circumstances that we'd probably rather not have found ourselves in. And we know where that comes from. Quite simply, the enemy. The enemy comes to steal, destroy, to kill. And I've seen it in my business, I've seen it with my friends, I've seen it with other Christians, etc. And there are times, yes, in the natural, if we're not careful, we could start to become demoralized. But that's not what God is calling us to do, church. He's called us to rise up, to take the power that Jesus gave us, that same power that raised him from the dead, take that power and start doing some work against what the enemy is doing, starting in Grimsby and going across the whole of this land. I want to show you what's happening, and it's all, it's all going to come together, with Israel at present. There's a map of Israel, if you can find it. Thank you. This, I'm coming back to the prophecy that was brought at the beginning of the year about persecution. Who would have thought... In January 2014, when that prophecy was, was given, that America not only will be talking to Iran, but would be working with them. Who would have thought that Syria, Iraq, parts of just the borders of Iran, starting as well in Lebanon, certainly in Syria, that would have this uprising of terrorists who go under the name of the Islamic State, who have decided that they want to go into Mersul and the northern parts of, of uh, Iraq and just kill and destroy the homes of the Christians. The 17,000 at present stuck, unable to move. In, in January 2014, that probably would have seemed impossible. But here we are in August, and this is going on now. These are our brothers in Christ who are struggling struggling to get out, away from this group of Islamic terrorists, whatever you want to call them. Now, I, I'm, please hear me, I'm not against Muslims. That's not what I'm here to tell you. What I'm here to tell you is that there's something going on. There's something going on. We know what it is. It's the Antichrist. And we need to be aware of it. I haven't come to bring you fear. I certainly haven't come to, to, to start getting you to worry. No, no, no. I've come to bring you the good news. And the good news is that God is on the move in these situations. And we are going to see a turnaround. We will see a turnaround. We will see a turnaround. So here we have 
Israel, surrounded by enemies, enemies of the state. Interesting enough, I read, I read in the papers the other day that the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt actually founded his regime, if you want to call it that, on the book by Hitler, Mein Kampf, and he changed it to Mein Jihad. And they have a goal, if you like, that's to completely destroy Israel. They want Israel out of the picture. Now we have Iran, who have said on several occasions they too want to destroy Israel. And we find Iran now talking and communicating and working with America. As we can see, the situation for Israel in the natural is looking darker and darker. But the truth of the matter is that God has got other plans because Israel is God's chosen nation. It's God's chosen land. And I want to encourage you that even though what the media keep plying out and pushing out, Israel will always stand. Because one day, our King of Kings, our Lord of Lords is going to come back and his feet are not going to touch Grimsby. They're not going to touch America. They're going to land in Israel. Church, we stop. we've got to stop looking at the media and what the media are portraying. We've got to be aware of what's going on. But we need to know and we need to understand in these days that God is on the move. Now we have this picture of Israel. And I know some people would say, well, okay, that's over there. It doesn't concern us. But it does. Because this year alone, 500 people, Muslims, have left England to go and fight in the Middle East. Of which about 200, they reckon, have come back. Now my question is, what have they come back to? The plan of the Islamic State, IS, is world domination with Sharia law. If anybody has um, seen the newspapers yesterday, there were demonstrations in London where it said 9-11, the end of democracy, the start of Sharia law in the UK. Sharia law is antichrist. It's as simple as that. Sharia law would completely get rid of all churches, any, po any possible way of us being able to freely worship. And that's what they want to do in England. Now, I repeat, I am not anti-Muslim. Let's make it quite clear. But I am clear where I stand. I am clear where this church stands. And this is a Christian country with Christian foundations. And we are going to rise up. The church is going to rise up and take its rightful position of power and authority in this land because Jesus is coming back soon. And he's coming back for his church. He's coming back for us. He's coming back for those who said, yes, Lord, I'm, I believe you are truly the risen Saviour. Yes, Lord, I accept you into my life. Yes, Lord, I turn away from my sin. I turn away from my previous life. I now want to walk with you. I want to be a disciple of the living God. He's coming back for us. But it's not about you. I want all my friends to be part of it. I don't want to be some exclusive club for one or two. I want everybody. Just across here, there's, a, there's an estate. And I read in the, the, the paper a long time ago, they were, let's say two or three weeks ago, that they were arresting a whole group that were involved in growing cannabis or whatever, or drugs and drug dealing. They're going to hell, church. They need the good news of Jesus Christ. And the trouble is, if we're not careful, we get stuck on this, we get stuck on all the fear and all the anxiety and all the worry and we forget about what God has actually called us to do. It's not that we've got to put it to one side. It's not that we, not, we, we shouldn't be aware of it. Yes, we should. And we're called to pray daily for the priests of Jerusalem. But what we can't do is allow the media to grind us down so much that we become ineffective. The fact of the matter is, the media can say one thing, the BBC or Sky News or Al Jazeera, but the fact of the matter is, I know a higher authority. His name is Jesus, and what he says goes. And things are about to change, and I declare that. Things are about to change. But what we need to do, and I want to spend time on this now, is to look at Psalm 91. We look to provision, okay? Provision comes... 
Because we have accepted Jesus Christ our Lord and Saviour. It's not about us. It's about him. And he has empowered us for today. He's empowered us for 2014 to go out and do what we're called to do. Each and every one of us has a purpose in life. And I want to challenge you. What is your purpose? What has God called you to do? What has God called you to do in 2014 that perhaps the media or somebody has held you back from doing? I want you to know that God wants you to know tonight that whatever it was that he's empowered you to do, don't allow the enemy to hold you back. Don't allow the enemy through media or whatever to stop you going and doing what he's called you to do. Church, it's time to rise up. It's time to take that sword and go out there and do some, do some damage to what the enemy is trying to do in this town and across this nation. You have purpose. And when you step out into God's purpose, something supernaturally happens. When you step out into God's purpose, you suddenly realize that what you were struggling to do before prospers. It prospers. When other people around you are struggling to do something, you suddenly find it's easier. When you're struggling, perhaps, whatever it might be, financially or relationship-wise, when you step out in God's purpose, things change. Why? Because before things can change in the natural, they have to change in the supernatural. And our God only operates in the supernatural. So I want to encourage you, church, in 2014, as we go forward, let's make the rest of this year a supernatural year. A supernatural year when we allow God to work through us and to do through us what he's called us to do, that we will not be held back. We will go forward. But it's always the question, when you go forward, you are going to be under attack. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you it will all be easy. It won't be a walk in the park, as they say. But you have to understand that God's already provided for that. And this is where I want to spend some time. It's on Psalm 91. And I've purposely taken the amplified version. And we're going to do it verse by verse. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Stop there. He who dwells. That's not for everybody. It's talking about the person who dwells in the secret place. That means who communes with God day and night spends time in his word, seeking his voice. What is he saying to me in this situation? What does he want me to do in, in this situation or that situation? He who dwells in a secret place of the Most High shall remain stable and fixed. I love that. Stable and fixed. One thing that this world today, Europe, America, wherever you want to go, one thing you can say, we're neither stable or fixed. Things are changing. We've picked up this word and the media use it. All the situation is fluid. Basically what it means, nobody knows what's going on. And you hear this all the time. I heard it today. Well, the situation with the pound is fluid. In other words, nobody knows. But the thing is that when we're in the shadow of the Most High, when we're in the shadow of our God, our King, our Saviour, our conquering hero, we remain stable and fixed. Why? Because you're under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. Whose power no foe can withstand. What's coming against you tonight? Is it sickness, disease, lack of funds? Whatever it might be that's coming against you, the word of God tonight is whose power no foe can withstand. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that things won't come against us. It's quite clear. Jesus says we will have and they will come against us. But the good news is that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Hallelujah. It might come on you, but it can't stay. It might kind come on you, but it can't stay. It has to go. It has to go. How? Because we remain in the secret place of the Most High. That's why it was important for me to bring, first of all, Romans. Simply because so many Christians believe that because they messed up yesterday or, or they messed up a week ago or whatever, they said something they shouldn't have done or they didn't do something they should have done, 
that the enemy comes and puts them under condemnation. Do you think God really wants you like that? Do you think God still really loves you? How on earth can you come before God? No. That's not what we read. That's not what we read. He who dwells in the mo- we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Why? Because of what Jesus did. It's not about our works. If we ever, ever, church, try and make it about our works, we can never dwell in the secret place. The only way to dwell in the secret place is to remind ourselves daily the love of Jesus. The love of Jesus. He died for me. He died for me that I might dwell in the secret place. So next time the enemy comes against you and tries to stop you with this or with that, Run to the secret place. Run to the secret place. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, on Him I lean and rely, and in Him I confidently trust. Here we go again. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, on Him I lean and rely, and in Him I confidently trust. It's taken me a long time, a long, long, long time for me to say, and in him I confidently trust. The Pete Davis of even two years ago, I would leave things to God and when nothing happened, guess what, I'd pick it up and run with it myself. And I get halfway down the road thinking, this is going nowhere at all. In the end, I go back and again give it back to God. But in Him, I come. Church is about giving it to God and having peace with it. You give it to God, you forget about it. Symptoms might not change straight away, they very rarely do. But God is on the move. God is about to do something supernatural in your life when you can confidently say, I trust in God, I leave it to Him, I have peace peace. In spite of what's going on in the world, I've got peace. In spite of the the bank situations or the financial situations, I've got peace. Hallelujah. For, again remember, it's, it's on the condition that we confidently trust him, for then he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. Hallelujah. Look what's happening in Africa at present with the spread of Ebola. Even the World Health Organization, World Health Organization? No. The World (laughs) Health Organization stated that the the spread will take months to bring under control. But I don't know if any of you watched the, I think it was CNN News, and they interviewed a Christian relief worker who had come back, and he'd recovered from Ebola. And he was giving Jesus all the glory, all the praise. Why? Because... Jesus had delivered him. And this guy was saying separately on UCB that every, he was lying in the bed and he was, I think it's way over 100 temperature. Um, he, could, he couldn't see, he couldn't, he couldn't speak, the room was dizzy, etc., etc. All he did was repeat Psalm 91 time and time and time again. And he said he felt himself drifting in and out of consciousness. He felt himself, literally, his life slipping away. He said, no, I trust in you, Lord. I believe in you, Lord. Yes, I am healed. And he kept repeating time and time again Psalm 91. For then he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. Then he will cover you with his pinions, and on his wings shall you trust and find refuge. His truth and his faithfulness are a shield and buckler. Joseph Prince tells the story of a farmer who returns home to his farm to find his chicken sheds completely burnt down. Some of you may have heard this story before. And he walks into his chicken house that's completely burnt down. The charred remains. Nothing is alive. Everything's dead. And he's standing there looking down. And as he walks past, he inadvertently kicks a chicken that's been completely burnt. And as he kicks this chicken, a whole load of chicks run out from underneath, alive and well. Isn't that a bit about what God is saying to us in this psalm? That if we dwell in his presence, if we come under his pinions, if we come under his feathers and 
It doesn't matter what's going on around. It doesn't matter how black or bleak the situation might be, but when we're under his wings, church, we're untouchable. We're untouchable because it said, whose power no foe can withstand. And if we're under his wings, do you not believe that God will do what he says he will do? His truth and his faithfulness are a shield and buckler. Remember we talked about those arrows. We'll look at it in a minute. The shield to stop those fiery darts of the enemy coming against us. The shield to stop disease coming upon us. Sickness coming upon us. Poverty coming upon us. God wants the best for his church. God wants his church to rise up. God wants his church to shine. It might look like we're just a small group. It might look like we're just hanging on till Jesus comes back. No church. No church. No. We are living in glorious days when the church is going to get brighter and brighter, when the church is going to get stronger and stronger, when the church is going to get more and more and more powerful, until people are going to say, what on earth is it they've got? I want that. I want that. Church 2014 is the year when God has empowered his church to stand up and fight and do what we're called to do, to make a difference in this town. And when we make a difference in this town, church, it will go out. It'll go out across the whole of the UK into the west of Europe. Hallelujah. You shall not be afraid of the terror of the night, nor of the arrow, the evil plots, and the slander of the wicked that flies by day. The slanders of the wicked. Be careful, church, when we talk. I have been over the last few months somewhat perplexed and upset by the amount of bickering that goes on in churches. I know it doesn't happen here, okay? So I'm not looking at anybody. But I'm amazed that one church will call another church or one pastor will call another pastor. That's of the enemy, church. Get over it. If there's something you don't like, fine. Just give it to God. He'll deal with it. It's not your problem. Move on. If you're unhappy with that church, or what, that's fine. Find somewhere else, but go quietly. There's no need to start bickering and, and slandering off other churches. That's what the enemy wants. Because a divided enemy is easy to topple. But when we're together as one, be it Methodist or Anglican or Catholic or whatever, when we're one together, we sing that song, we're one in the Spirit. Church, it doesn't matter. When we go to heaven, there'll be no denominations. I can assure you, you won't come with a little door saying Methodists here, Anglicans here, Catholics here, and oh, um, Pentecostals are uh, over there. No, it doesn't work that way. So why are we trying to do it on earth? Six, nor of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction and the sudden death that surprise and lay waste at noonday, nor of the peasant that stalks in the darkness, we've looked at Ebola, nor of the destruction and sudden death that surprise and lay waste at noonday. Verse 6. Let's look at it for a minute. We had that picture before of terrorists, okay? Uh, what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening over further afar in Asia. These terrorists are coming back to the UK. They're not coming back to just the UK. They come back to France. They come back to Germany. They have an agenda. And if you don't understand what their agenda is, then you probably won't understand what I'm about to say. But they want to take control of the UK. They want to impose their regime on this country. Do not expect that radicalized terrorists that come back from these training camps abroad are going to simply come back and get a nine-to-five-day job working at the co-op. That's not going to happen. They've come back for one reason, and that's to cause havoc. We will see, in the UK, we will see death and destruction. And it will take us by surprise. But church, I'm not here, and I keep repeating, I'm not here to put fear in you. I'm only here to tell you that for us, for the church, the best is yet to come. Why? 
because there'd be a realization in this country that politics aren't working, the economic situation is not working. People are going to start to say, what on earth are we doing wrong? It's going to shake people up. I was talking earlier to Marco, and I said one of the major things that the enemy uses in today's society is simply the simple way it's, we see it in everywhere again, is just the media. He uses the media. He uses entertainment to keep us not focused on what we're called to do. I don't watch these programs. I haven't watched them for years, but sometimes they're sort of like you flick through the television. You see things like Coronation Street or EastEnders. And not that I follow them, I don't. But what happens is it's showing the worst side of human nature. It's showing arguments, it's showing quarrels, it's showing divisions, it's showing fighting, it's showing drinking, it's showing drug abuse. And now this country of ours, which is brought up on Christian principles, even the young children now who watch these programs, because mum and dad are watching them, they're taking drug abuse as normal. They're taking substance abuse as normal. Alcoholism is normal. The enemy loves it. The enemy loves it because through entertainment, he's taking the people's focus of what they should be focusing. While around, he's using his other people to prepare for what he wants to do. We will see destruction in the UK. It's going to come. It will come. Cobra has already met four times this month with supposedly terrorist threats or, or threats that they've come across through eavesdropping phone calls or emails, I don't know, but possible terrorist attacks in the UK. Verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. We've seen in Africa, with Ebola, hundreds of people and there are thousands of people dying. There are so many different strains, some, unfortunately, even man-made. There is a laboratory in Holland which has produced a virus. I don't know why they've done it, but this virus is so virulent that if it got out, it would kill probably 25% of the population of Europe within three months. Now, why they've done it or how they've got away with it, I don't know. But imagine for one minute that that virus fell into the hands of a terrorist. What do you think he'd do with it? So we need to know, church. And again, I repeat it, and I will keep it. I'm not here for fear. I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to empower you. I'm here to tell you the good news of Jesus Christ that you do not have to worry, that in spite of what's going on around us, 10,000 may fall at your side, and 10,000 at your right hand. This is the word of God, church, but it shall not come near you. So the next time, hallelujah, thank you. So the next time you see something in the newspapers that starts to worry, you start to worry, oh Lord, what? forget it. Pull out Psalm 91. Read it to yourself. Declare it to yourself. Get it down in your spirit. It shall not come near you. It shall not come near your family. It shall not come near this church. Why? Because it says so in the word of God. For me and my house, that settles it. Only a spectator shall you be. Only a spectator shall you be. Why? Yourself, inaccessible in the secret place of the Most High. When you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, you are inaccessible to the enemy. You're inaccessible. He can't find you. When he looks for you, he sees Jesus. And when he sees Jesus, he runs. He runs. Hallelujah. As you witness the reward of the wicked, we are about to see something happen. I believe in, in the next 18 months, Something we haven't seen for a long time. There's going to be a transference of wealth from the wicked to the righteous. This has been on my heart for a long time. 
And when I was praying on uh, Saturday morning about bringing the word, God put it on my heart and remind them that a transfer is coming. A transfer of wealth from the wicked to the righteous. Because church, money is nothing but a tool. Let's make that quite clear. Money is a tool. But for the church to rise, we need money. We need money to go out and evangelize. We need money to, to set up um, a home because I think it will be necessary to set up homes for people when they lose their houses. But that money is going to be transferred to the church. Why? So that we can go out and do what God has called us to do with the finances, the capabilities to do it. So next time you're going to the airport and you see the guys going through with the gold on the here and there and he's rushing through and he's gone through the, the special, you know, the passport we don't have to because they pay extra, just tap him on the shoulder and say, well done, you're working for me now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nine. Because you have made the Lord your refuge and the Most High your dwelling place. There's a condition. Because... We have made the Lord our refuge and the Most High our dwelling place. All these things we've talked about, all these things that the media have been on about, all these things that the papers have published about this problem and that problem, financial problems and terrorists here and terrorists there, it shall not come near us. There shall no evil before you, nor any plague or calamity come near your tent. No. Church, what part of no do we not understand? No evil. No evil. Okay, so sickness tries to come upon us. If we dwell in the, in the, in the secret place of the Most High, it can't stay. You see, the enemy will try and convince you that it's there for life. The enemy will try and convince you that there's no way out. I'm here to tell you no, that's not true. The truth is that if you stay steadfast and strong in the love of Jesus Christ, you will see him move. I come back to what I said in the very beginning about understanding. It's not about us. It's not about works. It's about what Jesus did. Look at the Bible. Tell me, how many Pharisees do you see that got healed and delivered? None! But you do see a lot of sinners, a lot of sinners, a lot of prostitutes, a lot of tax collectors. Why? They understood what Jesus did. They understood what Jesus had done. They understood what Jesus had done. For he will give his angels a special charge over you to accompany and defend and preserve you in all your ways of obedience and service. Of obedience and service. Church, it's no good uh, stepping out of line with the will of God and then still expecting him to be there sort of like supernaturally. It's like if you're going to run out and play marbles in the, on the M1 at 9 o'clock in the morning and expect God to protect you, well, oh, something wrong there. Obedience and service. But you know, church, when we understand what Jesus did for us, when we understand the power of grace, the power of grace, the power of grace to equip us for today. The power of grace. When Jesus died on the cross over 2,000 years ago, he saw us here tonight. He saw us worshiping him tonight. He saw what we'd be going through, each and every one of us. And what did he do? He gave us grace. Hallelujah. He gave us unmerited favor. Hallelujah. He gave up his life, church. He gave up his life that we might have life to the full. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. They shall bear you up on their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent shall you trample underfoot. So far, so good. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will deliver him. This is a word for tonight, for August 2014, a word from God, I will deliver you, he says. What is it you're going through? Sickness or disease? What is it somebody said? God is simply saying to you tonight, I will deliver you. But not only that, 
I will set him on high because he knows and understands my name. He has a personal knowledge of my mercy, love and kindness. Trust and relies on me knowing I will never forsake him. No, never. I will never forsake him. No, never. Not only will he deliver us, but he's going to set us on high. Church, because of what Jesus did and has done, do you realize that we're sitting at the right hand? We're seated in heavenly places. Now is the time to start operating in the supernatural. Now is the time to stop looking down like headless chickens and start looking up like the eagle that soars above the storm, that soars above the tempest, that rises high. It's incredible what I read about, about an eagle. The more I read and understand an eagle, the more I realise what God meant. For example, do you know that when an eagle's feathers get get tired and worn, he flies high, as high as he can get, and he finds shelter in a rock, and he pulls away all of the rotten feathers, making sure there's room for new feathers to grow. And he cleans his beak to make it sharp, and his claws, he knocks continuously, day and night, until he removes all the old claws to make sure the claws are sharp, ready to catch his prey. Storm comes. An eagle doesn't run and hide like a chicken. No. He flies high above the storm. It actually uses the thermals of the storm to fly higher and higher. So although down below all the animals are suffering, the eagle is taking advantage of the, of the thermals of that storm to rise higher and higher. And I want to prophesy tonight to you, church, that the storm that you are going through, God is just going to take you higher and higher. That you are going to rise higher and higher. You will be stronger and stronger. You will be fitter and fitter. Church, you have to understand one thing. The best is yet to come. You need to know that. Why? Because it says so in his word. And we are a church that corporately and individually believes 100% the word of God. I'm going to have to read, I'm going to have to read chapter 14, um, verse 14 again. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he knows and understands my name. Has a personal knowledge of my mercy, love, kindness, trust and relies on me, knowing I will never forsake him. No, never. 15. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. Church, if you're lacking in something tonight, I want to encourage you. Reach out. Call upon him. He's here and he will answer you. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. It's very interesting. It doesn't say anywhere in that scripture that God will take you out of it. But what it does say is, I will deliver him. Some things we have to go through, church. Some things we might be going through right now, which isn't easy. I'm going through a lot of stuff, which is very difficult. And close friends of mine know it. But they're only close friends who know it. Why? Because sometimes it's good to share things, but I know my Redeemer lives. And I know that God has got a plan and a purpose for my life. And I'm not going to go around telling everybody about everything that's going wrong in my life. Nope. Because I trust God. I believe God. I believe his word. And I believe and I know that in these times of trouble that I'm going through, he's with me. He's with me all the time. And I know one thing. I will deliver him, he says, and honor him. God will deliver you. Amen. Amen. And he will honour you. Amen. But the enemy will come in and try and convince you that no, that's not going to happen. This is the end. That relationship is broken. It will never be restored. That sickness or disease or that financial situation will never change. That's a lie of the pit of hell. God will 
deliver you. Verse 16. <sighs> Hallelujah. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. If Jesus tarries, do you want to live to 120? Declare it. Declare it. That's what the word says with long life. How long do you want to live? Tell Jesus. I want to live to 120 or till you tarry. I personally believe that Jesus is coming back a lot quicker than that. But if he does tarry, 120. I've agreed with Jesus. In spite of situations or circumstances or how my body might feel, I don't, I don't listen to my body. I don't listen to my best friends. I listen to Jesus. What does Jesus say about this situation? I want to encourage you. What does Jesus say about the situation that you're going through? So quick, two seconds to recap. What do we look at? Provision, first of all. I hope you've understood this. It's not about works. It's not about what we do. It's not about how much we love Jesus. It's about how much Jesus loves us. Church is all about Jesus. Jesus has given us and provided us with all we need to live a victorious life in 2014, to excel in every situation. He's given us the power, the second P, power. He's given us power. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and living in each and every one of us. No excuses. There is no excuses not to succeed. There is no excuses not to win. There's no excuses not to come through victorious because God wants us to thrive when everybody else is just surviving. So he gave us provision, one. Power, two. Three, for a reason. Purpose. You all have a purpose. 2014 is your year of purpose. I want to encourage you, whatever God has told you to do, don't listen to that little nagging thing behind your ear, the enemy on your shoulder trying to tell you you can't do it. I'm here to tell you, God said, yes, you can. You can do it. Provision, one. Power, two. Purpose, three. Four. Pr prosper. When you're in God's purpose, you will always prosper. You will always prosper. So whatever God has called you to do, go ahead knowing that he will provide everything you need. But know this. That as you step out for Jesus, as you step out and do what he's called you to do, the enemy will come against you. And when he does, remember Psalm 91 of protection. Remember what it says, he who dwells in the secret place is untouchable. There was, when I was a young kid, I'm going to there was a film, uh, my father used to watch it. I'd only been about four or five, it was called The Untouchables. Can everybody, I think you're all too old. Hey, there's one can, yeah. And basically as a group of, I, th I think they were sort of, um, I don't know, bandits were they? I don't know what they were. But anyway, no, the police could never catch them. Now I'm not saying that we go around like that. But what I am saying is that when we're where God wants us to be, when we're doing what God wants us to do, when we rely on him, and that's the crux, rely on him, lean on him, confidently trust him, then no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Then you will succeed in everything you do. And in spite of what's going on in the world, in spite of 2014 being a difficult year, you will come at the end of the year and say, wow, what a year. Wow, what a year. Look what Jesus has done in my life. Because church, we're called to be a light on the hill. We're, we're called to stand up. We're called to defend our faith. And we're called to do what God has called us to do. If nothing else, remember the five Ps. Provision, power, purpose, prosper, and protection. Thank you for listening to me. I've really enjoyed myself tonight. Thank you very much.